Many of the population models that we have looked at in a previous chapter also have parameters, and that means that they're likely to have some bifurcations going on as well. Let's take a look at some of those examples. First of all, remember the continuous time competitive two species Latka Volterra model. This had two population sizes, X and Y, and the derivatives were quadratic polynomials in X and Y, depending on three different parameters, alpha, beta, and R. Now, R turned out to be a somewhat inconsequential growth rate parameter, but alpha and beta, the sensitivities of one population with respect to the size of another, those were really important. Recall, we found four possible equilibria in this system at 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and then the really interesting one at 1 minus alpha over 1 minus alpha beta, and 1 minus beta over 1 minus alpha beta. Now, the origin was always a source. The other two were one species wins. One zero was a sink if beta was bigger than one, and a saddle if beta is less than one. Hmm, that's interesting. Likewise, zero one was a sink or a saddle, depending on whether alpha was bigger than one or less than one, respectively. That fourth equilibrium, which only really physically made sense for certain sets of values of alpha and beta, this also had some peculiar classification. So this was a sink if alpha and beta are both less than one, and a saddle if alpha and beta are both greater than one. Now you could see that there's some bifurcations going on here. So to figure that out, let's inspect that fourth equilibrium at one minus alpha over one minus alpha beta, one minus beta over one minus alpha beta. If alpha equals one, that transition point at one of the equilibria, then what does this fourth equilibrium become? Well, it becomes, uh, let's see, zero over the denominator, that's zero, and then one minus beta over one minus one times beta. Ah, that's one. So when alpha equals one, we get the equilibrium zero, one, which is right where the transition happened there. Likewise, if beta equals one, then this fourth equilibrium simplifies to one comma zero. So what's really happening at these two different parameter values, we have a collision between the fourth equilibrium and either the second or the third, and a transition there, a switching of types. And of course, this indicates a transcritical bifurcation happening here. This is definitely something that you can see if you simulate the system and then start turning the dials. It's really interesting to see how this fourth equilibrium sort of comes out of nowhere from having negative non-physical values to popping into being. And then you can see, depending on how you change these things, how it collides into one of those two equilibria. For a very different sort of example, let's consider a predator-prey model, but in discrete time. This is going to be really interesting. We haven't done a lot with discrete time systems yet. Consider the following. E of x, y, again, these are two species sizes, is given by the following. So xn plus 1 is alpha xn times 1 minus xn minus xn times yn. And then yn plus 1 is 1 over beta times xn times yn. Here, alpha and beta are positive parameters. This is somewhat similar to the Lotka Volterra predator prey model that we saw, but there's a couple of differences. You could see there's sort of a logistic model hiding in there in the x term, but then we have this cross term in x and y, which pulls away from the x species and contributes positively to the y species. Now let's solve for the equilibria in this system. I'm going to leave it to you to check that the equilibria happen at 0, 0, and beta, alpha times 1 minus beta minus 1, so that we need some constraints on these parameters, namely alpha times quantity 1 minus beta has to be bigger than 1. Now go ahead and check that. Remember, finding equilibria in discrete time systems is different than in continuous time.
Now, of course, it's that non-zero equilibrium that is the interesting one. We expect the origin to, I don't know, maybe not be the most interesting thing for a population. Now, the next step is to compute the derivative of the right-hand side. Please take a little bit of time and check to see that the entries of that 2 by 2 matrix are alpha minus 2 alpha x minus y, 1 over beta y, minus x, and 1 over beta x. And once you're finished checking the math on that, then we have a little bit of work to do. Let's take that derivative, evaluate it at that interesting non-zero equilibrium where x equals beta and y equals alpha times 1 minus beta minus 1. When we do so, we get the matrix 1 minus alpha beta, alpha over beta times quantity 1 minus alpha minus beta, minus beta, and 1. Oh boy, what are we going to do? Are we going to compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this? I don't think so. But recall, we derived a trace determinant diagram for discrete time systems. So what can we do? We can compute the trace of this. It's 2 minus alpha times beta. We can compute the determinant. And there's a little bit of simplification that goes on to give you alpha times quantity 1 minus 2 beta. Now you're going to need to go back, take a look at that diagram, and investigate very carefully what happens when you vary the trace and the determinant based on these values of alpha and beta. And I claim that something weird happens at alpha equals 1 over 2 minus beta under the additional condition that alpha times beta is less than 4. There's something where you're going from having a spiral sink to a spiral source. There's an interesting transition there. That's not a type of bifurcation that we have seen before. Hmm, I wonder what is going on here. I think what this means is that we may have a few surprises left in store. We're not quite done with bifurcations.